Yes, we're open. Living Faith with Needham UCC, a sermon podcast from the Congregational Church of Needham United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you're invited and welcome. This sermon for Sunday, August 22nd, 2021, is entitled, What are your gospel accessories? It's a reflection on a reading from the book of Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. If you enjoy this podcast and would like to find out more about our open and affirming ministries at the Congregational Church of Needham, United Church of Christ, simply head over to our website, www.needhamucc.org. Thank you. Friends, our scripture reading today comes from the New Testament, from the letters of the early church, from the letter to the church at Ephesus, that is the epistle to the Ephesians, chapter 6, verses 10 through 20. Let's listen together for a living word from God for us in these words to the Ephesians and from Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of Christ's power. Put on the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day. And having done everything, so stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of faith. Excuse me, the gospel of peace. With all these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert and always persevere in supplication for all of God's holy ones. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly as I must speak. Friends, God is still speaking to the world and to us. May our hearts be open to listen and to respond. Amen. A disclaimer here, just because I am an ordained minister of the Church of Jesus Christ doesn't mean I have to like every passage in the Bible. I believe in the Bible, I trust in it, as a kind of complex spiritual biography of God's people, our people, in all our promise and possibility, in all our faults and frailties or more accurately, a record of our on-again, off-again relationship with the divine, pervasive more that we recognize and name as God. Which means that in my role as a minister and also in my personal life, I am obligated to honor that relationship and to take the Bible seriously. Seriously enough to form my own relationship with these words as I look for the Living Word, capital W, for my life and for our lives together today. Put another way, I have to love the Bible, but I don't have to like it. And truth be told, today's rather famous passage from the letter to the church at Ephesus is one I haven't cared for very much over the years. I have never been a huge fan 
of the language of spiritual warfare, these militaristic metaphors of the whole armor of God and the breastplate of faith and the sword and the call to combat the wiles of the devil abroad in the world we hear in this passage today. In fact, for the first many years of my official ordained ministry, I would go rather out of my way to avoid just this sort of imagery in both the New Testament as here and in the Hebrew scriptures, and it is in both places. I was, and I remain, troubled by the history of the Christian church when it comes to violence and war. We may have started out as the pacifist followers of a man executed by state violence, and we did. That's who we were at first. Early Christians refused even to serve in the armies of the Roman Empire because it brought them into conflict with their peaceful faith. That was one of the reasons our first forebears in faith were persecuted by the powers and principalities of their day. But once Christianity became the official state religion of the empire in the fourth century, well, the power went to our heads. And we began to practice that same kind of deadly violence ourselves. First against one another, one sect wielding the sword against another. Throughout the councils of the fourth century that decided who was in and who was out, who was a heretic and who was orthodox. And then the Western church against the Eastern church, and then the whole church against Jews and Muslims and others, and so many others. From our original pacifism, we moved on to justify just war, and then even holy war, crusades, pogroms, lynchings, domestic violence, gay bashing, deadly culture war carried out against any of our enemies, we could successfully brand enemies of God. And that just didn't sound like Jesus to me. And it still doesn't. So I quite intentionally erased all of that militaristic language from my preaching vocabulary in order not to perpetuate that misunderstanding, not on my watch. After all, my Christian faith was about love, God's love for us, Jesus's love for the least of these, our love for one another, our love for ourselves. The language of spiritual warfare and struggle was just a metaphor, after all. I could choose and did choose to use other language in my ministry. And I must confess before you here today, in my heart, I quietly pitied other less progressive, less evolved Christians who still insisted on talking that way about struggles and shields and swords. Those poor people, when would they learn? Well, then I met other people. I met people for whom the struggle to live the life of faith, even just to live, period, and to make a life for their loved ones, it isn't just a metaphor but a painful reality. People who have to strive constantly against the powers and principalities of our day, the sinful systems, all the isms arrayed against them, fight and strive for the human dignity that should be theirs by divine right and the resources that go along with that dignity. People on the receiving end of a whole lot of ugly coming at them from a never-ending parade of stupid. One of my favorite lines from Motor, Motormouth Maybell in the musical Hairspray. Poor folks, black and brown folks and other folks of color, indigenous folks, women, queer and trans folks, those living with disabilities, immigrants, and so many others listening to them and growing in relationship with them and even those parts of myself, I learned 
that the struggle is real, whether I choose to acknowledge it or not. And so language like this, in our reading from, Galatia, from Ephesians today, preached by Paul from his own place of oppression, from his own actual incarceration, may be an important life-giving part of their faith. I began to realize that it was my privilege that allowed me to set aside these prickly images and those folks' lives so easily. I am still learning, but I do know better now. I know now that our Christian vision of a world of justice, peace, and compassion for all articulated in such detail by the Hebrew prophets and by John the baptizer and by Jesus and here by Paul, that vision puts us into direct conflict with the world as it is, set up as it is to transmute the suffering of the many into the benefit of the few. The gospel life to which we are called isn't simply about sanding down a few rough edges, but rather utterly deconstructing and reconstructing the whole thing, the whole world. It's not remodeling, it's revolution. We are called to fight for the poor, to fight for ourselves if we are poor in body or spirit, to fight against sin and evil, all that undermines the dignity and inherent value of all persons, indeed even the value of all creation to fight less against individual people, as Paul reminds us in our reading today, than against the evil that people, people like us, do together. The systems, the societies designed to advantage some and disadvantage so many more. This is war. But in God, thank God, we are free to choose how we conduct this war and how we conduct ourselves in it. Recognizing, as Jesus said, that those who live by the sword will die by the sword. And as Gandhi said, that an ethic of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth will leave the whole world blind and toothless. We get to ask HWJF, how would Jesus fight? How did Jesus fight? How did Jesus constantly seek to undermine evil and rally the faint-hearted and build a whole new world? And we get to ask, if not swords and shields and breastplates exactly, if those images and ideas don't fit us just right, what gifts does God give us for this struggle? Because blessed and equipped by God for this war, for this work, we get to imagine. We get to imagine a whole new world and to imagine together the faith that will move us there. We get to imagine all kinds of surprising gifts. We get to imagine and then build and then work out a revolution that dances. So that's what I want to ask you today. That's what I want to ask you to think about. What are your particular gifts? What are your peculiar gifts? What tools has God given you to equip you for the facing of these hours, the living of these days, the doing of this gospel work, the struggle to love the whole wide world and transform the whole wide world according to God's purposes of justice, peace, and compassion. What do you got? In a time when we may all be feeling just a little bit hopeless and helpless, if not a whole lot, I want you to remember just how gifted and talented you are, all of us, all together, all of God's children, gifted and talented for this work. What tools has God given you already? 
what tools would you ask for? I'll go first. The first tool I want to lift up today is the cloak of righteous, uh, the, the cloak of belovedness. Here it is. It's small, but that's because I received it from my parents as a child. But it still covers me. And it reminds me that no matter what I do or what is done to me, I am loved by God with an unshakable love. Never underestimate the power of this gift of belovedness. Next, there are the spectacles of wonder. These glasses help me to ask questions and to appreciate differences and to make connections where there weren't any before. Notice that they are not rose-colored glasses, but instead are clear-eyed so I can see the world as it actually is, not just as I or anyone else would wish it to be. And finally this morning, the flamingo pool noodle of playfulness. I love this. It may seem like the most frivolous of gifts, silly even, but when you're trying to reimagine the world, play is serious business. Every child knows that. When we play, we practice. We practice relating to one another and rearranging the world. And we practice problem solving in a low stakes way that encourages us to be creative and courageous in the real world. So these are some of my special spiritual gifts that I bring to the work of the gospel. And Reverend Maddie, I think you've got some as well. Let me add you to the spotlight. There you go. Reverend Maddie, what are your gifts? I have three gifts to share also. I have the collar of confidence. And this is a gift because it is confidence rooted in God's love that no matter what I'm doing in my work or in my life, I know that God is right beside me and that God's presence will guide me. I also have... Oh, I'm on the wrong camera. The scissors of inspiration. <laughs> I bet you know by now that I love arts and crafts. And arts and crafts are one way that I can create and work through, cut through all those feelings that, that sometimes jumble us up and, and sort them out, make them make sense for me. And also a way that I can connect with all of you. And I have the gloves of grit. Oh, these are big. They're kind of heavy, but you know what? They help me feel strong when I take care of myself. I feel ready to do whatever work God puts in front of me. Thank you, Maddie. Thank you for sharing those gifts. And so this is the interactive part of the sermon today. I want you to, folks who are participating out via Zoom, I want you to think about what gifts do you have for living the life of faith in the midst of this particular moment? You don't have to come up with snappy names. You don't have to have props ready and on hand like Reverend Maddie and I. But I want to ask you to go ahead and think about that and type them in the window. Type them in the chat window. What gifts has God given you? We've got patience and humor and compassion. What tools has God equipped you with for the work of justice, peace, and compassion, which is the living out of our faith in everyday life? We've got gifts of love and relationship. The hurricane gates of love, an apropos gift for this particular moment. Courage and encouragement.
conversations with God that help me make those good choices. Uh, being a good listener, an underrated gift. Children in our lives, thinking differently and creatively. Gifts of language to communicate with people who are far away. Gifts of acceptance and understanding, accepting and understanding ourselves and accepting and understanding other folks. Gifts of curiosity. I like Jamie Turner says, God made him the levity czar during the pandemic. Talk about taking a word and turning it inside out. The levity czar, creativity and patience, forthrightness. I like that one. Doing gratitude. Baking for the people I love. Oh, let's not underestimate the gifts of food and feeding people's bodies as well as their spirits. Gifts of perseverance. My sewing machine on which I stitch love. I like that. I almost added my knitting needles, a whole new gift I've discovered in the last couple of, in the last year and a half. The gift that I can remind myself that I can make a difference in the world. I may not be able to end the entire problem of homelessness, but I can knit a scarf to keep one of my unhoused neighbors that much warmer. It's a reminder of all that I can do. Gifts of self-confidence, gifts of risk-taking and play and work, of empathy and a positive outlook. Gifts of silliness, you know I love that gift, Kathy. The love of words and the ability to suspend reality, sort of like suspending the bylaws so that we can rearrange things so they work better for more people. Willingness to learn new ways of doing things. Again, playfulness, seeing gifts in the small details of life and nature. Steadfastness, and particularly in a time of such radical change. Steadfastness to the core of love in our lives and wisdom. Friends, thank you for sharing all of these gifts. Thank you for sharing the gifts that God has shared with you. And I know there are more and so many more. I hope that you will spend some time, particularly in these days, but every day, trying to identify and recognize those gifts. Sometimes it turns out that a thing you think of as a disadvantage turns out to be an advantage. Sometimes feeling deeply, for instance, means that we grieve and ache with the pain of others around us, but it also means it's easier for us to stand in solidarity with them. Sometimes those gifts can be double-edged swords, like we talked about, like nitroglycerin that can be used to build bridge, blow up bridges or repair broken hearts. All of these come to us as gifts from God for the struggle for it is a struggle and it is a joy that is our daily living together. As Paul said, friends, therefore take on the whole armor of God, the entire costume closet of God, the entire toy box of God, all of the gifts of God so that you may be able to withstand, remain steadfast, to the core of love, doing everything we can and standing firm on love. Pray for one another that we might discover and use our gifts in the ways that God intends with boldness. For God intends us to be bold in this struggle for justice, peace, and compassion, the struggle for the heart of the world. Let us pray together. O holy God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts together here always be acceptable in your sight. Always reflect your truth and your grace. In all your holy names we pray.